Welcome, Dr. Gabriela Sanchez. It's an honor to speak with you today. And I know it's early morning for you and it's a bit of a late evening for me. So I'm here with my glass of wine talking to you. <laughs> and if you want at any time, please feel free to reach out for your coffee. Um, and for the audience here, Dr. Gabriela Sanchez is a wonderful um, colleague, my collaborator and good friend who is also an expert in trafficking and smuggling. So Gabriela is also a research fellow on border enforcement and immigration control at the Migration Policy Center of the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. As an anthropologist, she has written extensively about the criminalization of migrants' clandestine journeys and has particularly focused on documenting the experiences of migration facilitators. Her current work documents migrant smuggling dynamics in the Mediterranean. However, she has continued to conduct research along the US-Mexico border, where as a migrant, she has lived for most of her life and her academic career. And from our personal exchanges when I was in Florence, I can tell you that she is excellent is knowing where to go for the great pasta, where to go for the great Italian food and wine. So that's wonderful to have in an academic as well. Over to you, Gabriella. Thank you so much, Mina. And I am really, really grateful for, for the invitation. It's, it's, an, it's such an honor to be talking with you tonight. And um, I also have to introduce you, so let me be quiet. <laughs> So Professor Rina da Costa is professor at the Department of International Relations at the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs at the Australian National University. At the height of Europe's refugee emergency, she moved to the UNICEF Office of Research in Ocenti to build its migration and displacement program in 2016. Um, Dr. da Costa is um, current large research focuses on children protection in global humanitarian emergencies. We deep dives through human rights, framing and trafficking and smuggling, child and early marriage, child labor and gender justice issues. And this project also draws on SDG indicators for data and evidence. So, um, and I miss you every day, not having here, not having here you in Florence and walking by in Ocenti, you know, it's, it's, it's not the same as knowing, oh, Bina is there, so. <laughs> I miss you, but I'm very happy that we get to have this conversation tonight. Thank you, Gabriela. So my first question to you is about your own research. You are one of those few researchers who have done absolute amazing primary research. And through that, you have sort of critically talked about how we should uh, so analyze and how should we think about these terms, human trafficking and smuggling. And I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, how you define that, because we know that in terms of international discussions, when we are looking at trafficking, it doesn't necessarily have to be about mobility or movement. And in this COVID-19 world, we also know that there's so much work that's coming out, looking at and sensationalizing this discussion of trafficking. So mm -hmm. just wanting to get a sense uh, from you, how you want to define human trafficking, how you see that um, there's a difference between these discussions of trafficking and smuggling um, and how we could actually move forward with that. Mm -hmm. So trafficking and smuggling are terms that are imposed from the global north and that they are, or they, that they were first articulated in the context of the Palermo Protocol, seeking to determine or to establish practices or in reference to practices of mobility. But at the same time, they were very focused on controlling migration. So we have these two terms, human trafficking and smuggling of migrants that many people use actually interchangeably. According to the protocol, 
smuggling involves the facilitation in exchange for a material benefit of the entry of somebody into a country that is not his or her own. While trafficking involves coercion, intimidation, um, and the extraction of a benefit from a, a, a specific person. But there is this very clear notion of coercion embedded into it. So we have these two concepts that in, in part of the, the critique, part of articulating a critique is comes from the fact that they really are many times not very reflective of the experiences of the people on the ground. Mm -hmm. Because the trajectories of, of people who are on the migration pathway are not linear. Mm -hmm. What I mean by this is somebody who paid a smuggling facilitator for a journey, mm -hmm. the very next week or as part of that journey, may end up in a situation that he or she did not expect, having to work, having to care for somebody that he or she was not expecting, um, being in labor-like situations where she, he or she is not compensated for, and then the next week going back to another situation where he or she is able to pay to cover another leg of a journey. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the core issues at the, at the center of our critique. How many of those concepts really do not fit the reality of people as they, as they move, and how, in fact, these narratives of being forced, of being coerced, or being in transit are used as enforcement mechanisms, as tools to patrol, to patrol the way people move. Thank you, Gabriella. So what you're saying is that a choice is something we need to probably unpack here about this uh, being forced and coerced, and also um, thinking about the differences of understanding of trafficking in global uh, now, uh, North and Global South. So I was just wondering, um, if from your fieldwork experiences, if you could give us some examples where we, you saw that the stark uh, differences were very much apparent. Mm -hmm. I have um, one of the, again, one of the concerns that we have, those of us who engage or to try to look at the narratives, at the larger narratives of smuggling and trafficking is um, how many times, let me give you an example. When people travel, or the practices rather that facilitate people's journeys, mm -hmm. are not inherently criminal. Mm -hmm. So many times the people who help you move may be women who have an extra room to let you stay for a night, or somebody who has a car or a boat or a raft to get you across a, across a river. Mm -hmm. And these are not, again, necessarily criminal practices, but practices that have to do with mobility, with solidarity, that are based more on community life. When the protocol and the definition of human trafficking and smuggling of migrants was introduced, what we started to witness was how many of these practices, again, providing shelter, providing care, uh, transportation, suddenly became criminalized. Mm -hmm. So the forms that communities already understood as forms of trade and mobility mm -hmm. became the target of surveillance, of policing. Um, people started to become, people became more likely to face prison detention mm -hmm. in ways that put not only migrants at risk, but also the communities that depended or that relied on these practices. I'll give you a specific example on the U.S.-Mexico border. Mm, women who, for example, would welcome migrants who were in transit and who were looking for a place to stay for the night, who will charge $20, $30 for, for people to spend the night and to receive a place to stay and maybe some food, suddenly became identified in criminal investigations mm -hmm. as smugglers, mm -hmm. as uh, members of transnational criminal organizations, mm 
and as criminally liable when their actions really had no criminal intention of any kind. But the existence or the articulation of smuggling and trafficking as offenses created that space, again, for people's expressions of solidarity or um, support for those who were on the migration pathway became offenses. I hope that's, that, that gives you a sense of something that what, what we get to see in the field. That's right. Yeah, that uh, does um, actually uh, also resonate with some of my experiences um, uh, working in some of the emergencies in UNICEF and also previously from experiences in South Asia, how I've seen how movement um, become criminalized in terms of uh, who are aiding and abetting in those and how we actually have a very murky kind of definition of traffickers and smugglers. So I, I, I think um, it's really important to look at some of those nuances. Um, and uh, one area where uh, I think I talked to you about this before, Gabby, that um, the uh, traditional ways of doing advocacy with communities in these kind of stages where you have so much inequality, so much oppression, those are not working anymore because people are um, reaching out to those who are working within the community as uh, who are uh, who from uh, from outside are being identified as traffickers and smugglers to provide some support to the community. Uh, so mm -hmm. we need to really think about it in a very different way. Um, in this context, my question to you is that U uh, UN agencies um, in the human rights framing thinking through the development uh, lens as well, um, have um, uh, discussed some of those issues and engaged particularly uh, with the Bali process in our region uh, and also with the US-Mexico border discussions in uh, 2018. And then previously between 2015 to, um, uh, between, uh, for, uh, starting from 2015 uh, a bit more visibly, the New York Declaration and the Compact, so much of it is, was at the forefront of so many different levels of debates and conversation. So we have a bit of a, um, a confusion of how we think about trafficking and how we think about uh, smuggling. Then obviously the new discussions of slavery, modern, modern day slavery, and how we talk about particular kind of activities within that, like, for example, labor, exploitative labor conditions and marriages and early marriages, uh, thinking about women and girls and the exploitation and, um, and abuse and violence, all of that. So it seems like an overblown kind of field. So in this context, my question to you is that if we use a human rights framing, um, is, is, do you see as a, um, the possibility of looking at trafficking and smuggling in a bit of a different way? Or do you think we really have to critically um, unpack these terms and perhaps start from the beginning or, or start again uh, from a while earlier and then come to the human rights frameworks? Over to you. I think there's, I think dismantling smuggling, you know, in, in here, this, this may sound like a very you know, big term. I think that critically engaging with the notion of smuggling and trafficking involves work from all different angles. We definitely need to continue pushing for a human rights framework, one that understands that at the core of trafficking and smuggling practices or the practices that we refer to as such is or lies the lack of legal, safe, dignified, dignified paths for migration. Access to visas, access to passports is extremely unequal. Not everybody can just go and, and apply for one. Not everybody is going to go and, and be able to have, um, to be able to, to be granted, you know, that kind of authorization. In fact, for many of us who have lived for, you know, let's say in the case of the US, if American, an ordinary American citizen applied or had to apply for a visa to enter the United States, he or she would not be able to fulfill the requirements. 
because of how steep we are. So we need to, at the core of the conversation, once again, what we have to emphasize is that access to protection mechanisms is very unequal and that this access favors specific groups. Some other point that I think is very important that you mentioned, we see this coping or, or coming together of an, an even um, interchangeable use of the term smuggling and trafficking. I actually think that is very intentional. Mm -hmm. oh. for, for, you know, I think we have, I, I think UNODC as the, um, um, as a body that um, supervises, if you want to call it, the, the, the protocols, has um, has spent many, many years trying to, to articulate a very clear, a very specific definition of trafficking and smuggling. But at the, at the time, or at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, what we see more and more in practice is that it's easier to bring them together, to use them indistinctively. And I am not saying here that international bodies are evil or that they, um, the, 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 they are not on the side of, of people. What I want for all of us to understand is how structurally the mechanisms of the paths to access mobility are unequal that not everybody is going to have access to them, that not everybody has the same access to protection. And that, and that that access is pretty much shaped in terms of your gender, your race, and your class. Mm. So, and, and the likelihood of you getting access to mechanisms of protection is directly connected to, to those factors. So that is, um, that is one of the, the, the main points that we have to, to have in mind beyond definitions, what is, what are going to be the implications to my, to, to our, to, to my dignity as a human being when I cannot have equal access to the mechanisms that are going to allow me to travel safely and in a dignified way. Mm. I hope that's, that was kind of a long answer, you know, but I. That's so important what you've mentioned and here um, the, the points I picked and I was writing, actually taking uh, notes, uh, but uh, uh, what I also see that you've indicated um, that despite decades of um, uh, engagement from the international, like the UN ODC, uh, about mm -hmm. how these terms are um, different, but how, also how they're operationalized, but in some ways maybe how they're weaponized to think that about way. control. We need to think about that. Maybe we need to articulate it more. Uh, and also the other point about inequality. It's a very, very important kind of way of looking at the discussions of trafficking and smuggling. And there's very limited research done mm -hmm. actually on this kind of um, look uh, through that hook, the uh, yes. hook inequality. Because it's often understood from the lens of crime uh, and what it does is that it immediately balances how communities want to take ownership of some of the ways of um, uh, effective engagement. But the last point is about um, the uh, operationalization of those on the ground, how that happens. Mm -hmm. And maybe um, uh, we need perhaps more data and evidence or more understanding. Data and evidence are obviously the languages mm -hmm. of international bureaucracy and national bureaucracy, how they want to capture information for policy mm -hmm. purposes. But if we uh, use the, those kinds of language of data and evidence, um, uh, uh, what I hear you say is that perhaps we have to methodologically think differently which means mm -hmm. hacking the concepts that for whom these are useful and for whom these are not and how these are operationalized, how these are weaponized. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and this, um, I remember uh, when I was writing for you, actually, uh, I talked about this in terms of unpacking the discussion about crisis, that refugee crisis and migration exactly. crisis, how we talk about it. And now actually I see in, uh, and some of us um, have talked about it, right? You and myself included, 
that how this COVID-19, the pandemic, have again uh, opened up this discussion of vulnerabilities uh, for those who are being trafficked and smuggled. So the discussions are again very much of a sensationalist approach. So I want to hear a little bit from you about this. In, in, because you're an anthropologist and we come from very different discipline, in international <laughs> relations is relatively new. My colleagues talk about uh, wonderful colleagues like Emma Hutchinson, I'm immediately thinking about, and uh, Roland Blaker and others who talk about emotions. And I know in anthropology, you have toyed with emotions for a long time. So media, how it talks about trafficking and how it sensationalizes it. Then we have uh, television shows, the movies, how we talk about it. Um, I actually have this fantastic book by uh, Lila Tuliaraki, The Ironic Spectators. Ironic Spectator. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, and there are other colleagues who are looking at issues of media. So I'm just wondering, I know I'm like throwing a very broad net at you all, but I'm just wondering how you deal with all of this murky, murky kind of um, ways of looking at these issues, how you pull back from not engaging, or perhaps you do engage, about the sensationalizing understanding of trafficking and smuggling, and how you want to make sense of this analytically? Mm -hmm. um, I love how you started talking about this notion of data and, and evidence, because this is something that we have to deal with so much in our you know, line of work. Um, I often get into this discussions with people, because they tell me, you know, I. Um, when I first started doing research on, on migrant smuggling, people used to tell me there is no data. Mm -hmm. There is no data. It's very difficult to get access to the data. Mm -hmm. But once we find it, then we're going to have the evidence. But then I also noticed that there was really no effort at collecting mm -hmm, the specific data that could inform effective in inquiries or um, productive, you know, um, conversations, even when, when it came to um, smuggling and trafficking. And that is because from the very beginning, the, the just to think about smuggling and trafficking already transports our mindsets to look into the underground, the hidden um, criminal mm -hmm. that historically has been very much connected to the way we also think about people from the global south, people of color, um, women of color, for example, all of um, most of the representations that are often brought up when we talk about human trafficking are gendered. Most of them are, you know, in, 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 or representations of women. Many times bodies that are chained or that are hurt, white bodies. <laughs> There's very troubling images of white bodies and then black hands holding them or of um, brown and in black bodies chained in um, so you, it, what we would just watch, you know, on, on television. Most of the coverage and trafficking refers to not all, not necessarily to, to sex trafficking, but actually to sex labor, to you know, to sexual labor, to for, to prostitution, and and, and this concepts of that the only form of sex trafficking and the only form of human trafficking can be related to to sex. So for me, a lot of those questions started from how I so how I myself how I saw myself within those representations, thinking, I, I am a woman of color. I am a woman from one of these countries that is often represented in the literature of smuggling and trafficking. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel comfortable with, with those representations because I do not think that they are, in fact, critical, insightful, or revealing of the conditions that, that, that women face. Mm -hmm. So, it is for me the the research that I do and the the angle that I take in the research is very much derived and rooted 
from how I see the representation of women, especially, once again, women of color in the case of trafficking. And well, and most of my work, as you know, has been on migrant smuggling, which actually also is highly gendered because it relies on representations of men of color from the global south and male bodies that are articulated are represented as inherently violent, hypersexual, and um, involved in this kind of um, efforts to bring down the state. And for me, interrogating these images from where I stand as a woman of color has always been very important. Many times because I am the only woman of color you know, in the discussions at the, the meetings that I go to, but also because I, I, I was trained as, as a scholar, as an academic to, to look beyond these this images, to look beyond representations and to try to understand what was hidden behind them and what were the messages that they were trying to communicate. Um, thank you, Gabriela. Uh, actually, it also reminded me of, you know, when you were talking, I was rem re uh, being reminded of those images of uh, those boats across the Mediterranean Sea about those mm -hmm. search and rescue missions of black bodies. And mm -hmm. many, 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 some of them are very powerful films about those who have lost their lives um, in the water and mm -hmm. crossing through Libya. And in all this discussion about Libya being the chaotic criminal space where, you know, you feel like Libya is uh, the way it's portrayed is the way, uh, I think a one colleague from the Pacific talked about Manus as well that as if it's the lands of hell that are in, the, in our imagination, you know, if you go and having been to Libya before, I don't think that's the exact kind of scene. I mean, it's just, again, a very um, a problematic understanding of a space, of a land, of somebody's homeland, how that becomes a space of, of, of where only criminals operate and where they prey on the vulnerable. So this whole uh, discussion of black bodies and brown bodies as victims who are being, uh, you know, um, coming through uh, Africa's shore to Libya and from there to Europe. So this whole journey, again, very dark. And um, this is highly problematic. Yet, I think this is constantly being repeated. And again, mm -hmm. the Rohingya emergency also, I see it being repeated mm -hmm. all the time. How we talk mm -hmm. about Kutubalong camp, where I have uh, done so much work, and uh, you know, the space as a space of despair, as a negative, as a horrible space where crime and disease breed. So these discussions, and these are from actually also liberal, secular uh, perspective. It's not only we are talking about those who are coming from the right. So mm -hmm. I think we also have to recognize that our biases of when, how we are actually also positioning ourselves, how we are writing the narrative, where we also through our discussions and our analysis um, sort of miss the, uh, miss the point that victims also become doubly victimized uh, through our articulation and in our advice. Mm -hmm. And I see that that's what you're trying to do. So to me, it is a really powerful way of doing it. But then I also think, are we actually a bit, I don't know, outside the you know regular kind of way of thinking about it? Is it, are we being, is this a utopia we are thinking about? Is this actually even possible to think that victims have that empowering voice in our, uh, through our writing? Because mm -hmm. um, if we only talk about, if we are talking about victims as survivors, and there's, I, I know there's a lot of work on that from war crimes and gender work, um, but migration is obviously, and trafficking and smuggling is also a new area. Mm 
So I'm just wondering how you were thinking about it, that in your discussion, do you actually erase those narratives of victimization or mm -hmm. extreme vulnerabilities? Do you start just, uh, or, or is, there, is there a middle ground where we can represent extreme vulnerability, extreme victimization at the, mm -hmm. at the same time that can be an empowering narrative? and empowering analysis. Is that possible or are we talking about something that's not actually possible? Mm -hmm. I want to believe it is possible. Mm -hmm. And that's because when I, when I first started, I'm, I'm going to give a bit of my background here, but when I first started doing research on smuggling and trafficking, I was doing it um, I was a criminal investigator on the U.S.-Mexico border at the same time that I was going to university. The only reason they hired me was because I spoke Spanish. Mm -hmm. It was I had never done an interview. Um, they asked me that during my uh, my job interviews, like, "Oh, have you interviewed people?" So like, "Sure, I've been interviewing scores of people all my life." Um, I'm I'm giving you this bit of information because for the, the next seven years, which was my years at the university and also in graduate school, um, I was helping a state agency convict people for um, um, charges of migrant smuggling and human trafficking. And from the very beginning, it became very clear to me that that was not what I wanted to do. But I, at the same time, there was not a lot of literature that articulated a critical perspective on the kind of, that I, of work that I was doing. For me, going into academia became that solution at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Like maybe if I get a degree, maybe if I, if I get a master's degree, and then after that, well, maybe I should go and get a PhD because these stories, not stories, these perspectives, these accounts, these testimonies, deserve to be understood and deserve to be theorized. Um, and then from, from there, by the time I was done with the PhD, I never thought I, and, and this is something that I often tell my students, I don't think even in my wildest dreams, I thought that I was eventually going to be invited to be part of these conversations at the UN level, mm -hmm. at meetings with IOM. I say this because I believe that there is space to bring these critical perspectives that draw from the experiences of the people who live them on an everyday basis. Um, I work very closely with this agencies, bringing that data and that evidence, showing that exploitation is a very subjective term that violence is also very subjective and that the person who one day may be experiencing violence the next day may be actually be um, oppressing or hurting or being violent to, towards somebody else. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say by all this is we can create those spaces and we should team up, <laughs> find people that, you know, that, that share that desire to create those spaces with you. <laughs> In my case, it has been, for example, you know, our collaboration, our friendship, um, that of uh, the people that I work with at the EUI, you know, you know, some of the people that I work at the EUI at trying to unpack all of these messages of trafficking and smuggling my collaboration with people within very large organizations who are also trying to go beyond what is usually said because they understand there, there is I think that, that greater awareness that many of our narratives that many of our discourses are really not reflective of what is happening on the ground that's right so so I think there is, um, it's not necessarily utopian to think about you know, what, what would happen. Again, I, when I first started, I didn't think that this was ultimately going to be the case. You know? uh, 
I had a I had a boyfriend and I thought I was going to stay on the border all my life. <laughs> but um this being able to position my my work based on the experiences and the testimonies of the people mm-hmm. allowed me mm-hmm. to um to create those spaces for research but also for the people. Mm-hmm. Thanks Gabriela. It seems like uh, so that personal and political they intersect with each other and because we make important choices but also to think about that when we are looking at issues um, through compassion and empathy and critically engaging in different ways and trying to bring different voices it's possible for us to uh, consider a different world and open it up for very productive engagements with Mm -hmm international organizations and bringing in the voices from uh, communities and from very much from the bottom-up perspective so it actually also requires continued engagement and that investment of time and energy that you so Mm -hmm. powerfully described Um, so thank you so much Gabriela for this wonderful discussion this wonderful conversation with you I very much enjoyed talking to you um, and our, for our audience who are listening to us or who are watching us, um, please feel free to uh, find us through Google, Gabriela and Vina, and you're welcome to reach out to us for uh, further uh, with your questions or comments or anything. Thank you. Please do. Thank you so much for watching. And thank you so much for the invitation, Vina. Thank you. <laughs>